What's up, world? What's up, internet? This is the Blockchainers. This is Sian. Uh, this is Yon. And today on the Blockchainers Beanbags, we have our special guest, Max Kordek from Lisk. What's hey, up, Max? Uh, great. I just arrived in Korea. It's amazing here. The mosquitoes love me, but it's really an amazing place. I like the food. I had a lot of meetings already. It's a great place for blockchain. And I'm looking forward to the other days I'm staying here. And thanks again for having me. I'm really excited for the interview. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Max usually isn't this rigid, but we'll get him fucked up after we are done with the interview. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yes, it's our, it's our first time doing, doing our interviews in English. We did a lot in Korean. But right. you know, hopefully we'll have a lot of fun doing the interview. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming here. You're welcome. All right, you want to start? You want to kick it off? Oh, yeah. It's, um, I think... Um, we've heard that you're on the Asia tour. Like, can you briefly explain to the uh, viewers that, that what you're guys are doing in China, Korea, and Japan, and like your future plans briefly? Mm -hmm. Of course. So we are a European project, okay? And we've been to America a few times, and we feel like Asia is huge. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's huge. It has the most population in the world. Uh, it has the biggest blockchain adoption in the world. And we decided we want to make once a market entry to a new to three new countries, Japan, India, and Korea, mm -hmm. and we want to strengthen our bonds in China. So that's why we planned this Asia tour, um, in which we're traveling to these four countries, four cities in two weeks, together with Thomas Schouten, our marketing lead. Mm -hmm. um, and we basically want to spread the word. Mm -hmm. We want to get listed on exchanges. We want to get people into the Lisk community. Maybe we find even Lisk ambassadors. So if you really are excited about Lisk and you want to help out, reach out to us and we might even get you involved into the whole process. And until now it's been a blast. It's really, really exciting but also tiresome because there's really one meetup after another, mm -hmm. one meeting after another, and so many interviews, it's great. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, so tell us, I know that you guys recently also got like new team members and your team's a lot bigger than how I remember from last year. You want to tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about the team members that you got? Yeah, sure. So we started hiring early this year. Mm -hmm. um, we started back in the day just with Oliver and me, then we expanded the team one by one and since like a few months it's really gone crazy. We are now 20 people. We just hired our first student assistant, mm. amazing. Um, we now have a marketing team of five people, um, really strong. Our Twitter engagement exploded, I think, just because of the amazing work by our marketing team. Um, developers, oh man, there's so many joining. I don't even know the number. It's like um, 40, <laughs> really? 14 technical people in the team and I think four or five new developers, DevOps, Q&A and backend development already signed the contract mm. to start in the coming months. Um, it's really exciting. The team explodes. We ha we're running out of office space. We're currently renting four offices at WeWork in Berlin, Sony Center. Um, it's amazing. And yeah, I think the trip just goes on from here. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to hire more and more people to support this amazing project we're building. Mm -hmm. How do you... Okay, this, well, this is like kind of a random question, but... You know, nowadays, you know, people when they're when they're weighing projects and stuff, one of the things they do is they go through the teams. They're kind of looking at how many members there are. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, how, when did you guys when did you guys know it was the right time to expand? And also, your team, your focus is very different because you have a pretty heavy marketing team too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So sometimes it just doesn't make sense to expand the team because it's much quicker to go for one or two months just with the team you have with this very small core team which pushes forward really strongly, mm -hmm. um, but there's always a time where the work is just so much that you need to expand it, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially in a blockchain project, you have a large number of different products in the pipeline. For example, we at Lisk, we have Lisk Core, we have the Lisk Explorer, we have Lisky, Lisk JS, we have um, the SDK coming up, Lisk Nano, there's really a big number of products and it's not like one or two developers can work on all these different products, you have to have teams dedicated on these different um, technologies and projects so that they can really go deep into it and deliver a good project, you know, mm -hmm. a good product. Um, and how to know when is the right time is really difficult to know in my opinion. 
but you will feel it when the work gets so much that you're basically right. sitting 16 hours a day in the office mm -hmm. to just get the shit done, you know, yeah. then you feel like, oh man, now I need more people. And for marketing specifically, um, we felt like, okay, our, our software now reached a point of maturity or stability. Now it's time to market it, to start the marketing machine mm -hmm. so that when the SDK comes out, we really have a strong foundation to build upon. Mm -hmm. I think it doesn't make sense to have like zero social media activity but a great product mm -hmm. you know so that's why we started hiring marketeers as well yeah I mean you know you know the popular handle on Facebook has been um, hashtag neo effect it's that whole thing with rebranding and how every time you rebrand the price just skyrockets and, yeah um, yeah I, mean, I think I think it will, not only will you have like people who love Lisk honestly to be honest with you I think you'll have more haters than uh, people who love your product, you know, like people mm -hmm. are saying it's overhyped and whatnot. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I don't think so. Um, I think just that the haters are louder than those who like your product. Yeah. Um, I don't know where the incentive or motivation comes from to hate on a product, um, but well, this happens every day in the internet. It happens on Bitcoin Talk on Twitter. You see it all the time. Um, but the rebranding, we are also doing one, like Neo did it. Um, is in my opinion not a hype element. Yeah. It's just a move towards a more professional brand and a more professional outward appearance. Mm -hmm. um, we at list we merged it together with a better user experience which comes out of it at the end, but I think it should not be used as a hype element. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, about a question about the uh, your team. I mean you have a very strict um, so requirement to be a for people to be a full time employee. Mm -hmm. So you gotta live in Berlin mm -hmm. with you guys, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like geographically very centralized. Is there any reason why you choose that policy, and uh, what are the costs and benefits of those of that policy? Yeah, of course. Um, so it's definitely essential for a team to be in one place, in my opinion, mm -hmm. because a centralized team is like the most efficient team you can get. Like people all over the world spread over different time zones, only communicating on Slack or Skype. It's never as efficient as a team coming into the office at 9 a.m., mm -hmm. working the whole day together until the evening, you know, and if there's some stuff which needs to be defined or which needs to be discussed, they just say, hey, come over, we need to talk, and then they, they, they um, basically do it in like two three minutes you know they define everything they discuss it and that's it mm -hmm. um, we make it mandatory to be in Berlin because Berlin is the blockchain capital in Europe mm -hmm. um, even though our legal foundation of LISC um, is based in Zug, Switzerland mm -hmm. um, but it is very very hard to get developers to Zug mm -hmm. it's a small village mm -hmm. it's an amazing and beautiful place yes but it's still very hard to get the best of the best great developer, designer, marketeers to Zook. Mm -hmm. They all want to come to Berlin because right. Berlin is just so amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> if I'm talking about like the, the pros, um, additionally to those which I just said is that you can really build an amazing team culture. Mm -hmm. um, it's not about just working and contributing on GitHub. It's also about like fulfilling your life mm. with what you're doing daily. Yeah. Um, and by having this amazing culture of team members mm -hmm. meeting after work, mm -hmm. drinking a beer, playing ping pong, mm -hmm. you know, that's just amazing. So everyone comes into the office in the morning and just want to work. Mm -hmm. They are not sitting home alone mm -hmm. and just think, shit, today I need to do two more pull requests. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and about cons, well, the only con is that we can't get any talent because not everyone is willing to move. Uh -huh. um, but I think there are so many great people out there. Um, if someone is not willing to move, we will find another one. And we did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got uh, some following up questions, like follow up questions. Uh, the, all, like, the point of open, being an open source is that you, you, you kind of try to get the contribution from other developed from all of the world, right? So, I mean, if you are too centralized in one place, it, can it be, can it like, kind of undermine those kind of aspect of being open source? Mm -hmm. um, and second question is, you gotta decentralize this uh, at some point, right? You can't 
So foundation to not take care of everything like after five to ten mm. years, right? So mm. when is a good time for you to kind of like decentralize the um, development um, to the uh, voluntary participants? Yeah. Um, so first of all, open source means that the code is open. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, um, we are trying to be um, as open, as transparent as possible, mm -hmm. but we are not a project where everyone can do whatever he wants to do. Okay. We are a startup. Okay, we have a roadmap, we have a vision, we have the guts to fulfill this vision and we can't just accept any pull requests because it's very hard for, out war for people who are sitting not in our office to get 100% the vision and the plan mm -hmm. we have, you know. Okay. Um, that means we sometimes just have to say sorry, no, we can't accept your pull request it doesn't align with our vision. Mm -hmm. And this will become increasingly um, the case because, for example, with the list core, we want this ultra lean core, you know? Lean, simple, it means secure, or easier to secure it. Um, and if now people starting to add like random API calls, for example, which not even follow the RESTful standard, you know, then it means often like bad code. Yeah. Also, we have like so many developers now sitting in our office, it takes sometimes longer to review a pull request to then add the necessary tests, functional tests, unit tests, to know that it really performs as it should be. It takes longer than if the developer just writes it himself. You know, mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely like we always welcome community contributions, mm -hmm. but as a startup, it's just very, very hard for us to accept any pull request. Okay. If we are now later speaking about the um, about the user interface, this will be an absolute no go. Mm -hmm. We can't do it because every element we will add needs to go through a rigorous scheme of um, conceptualizing, thinking about the UX thinking about the user interface and then the design mm -hmm. and then maybe even doing an A and B test right. to see if it's really working. Right. Um, so we're becoming quite rigid in that sense, mm -hmm. but I feel to really get like the most out of the project, okay. it's not, it's necessary. Yeah, I think uh, it, might, it might make sense for like when you're actually bootstrapping the project, right? Uh, there's a lot of things to do, you need to, uh, you've you got limited resources, you need to uh, focus on just like few things that matters the most, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, there, there, there will be a point where you got you got to decentralize it, right? You can't control it like, it's like forever. So yeah. when is the good time for you to sort of like once it's finished? Okay. Um, <laughs> so, the great thing about Lisp is it's modular. Okay. Later on, you will be able to add any feature you might need or want with a sidechain. Mm -hmm. So someone wants privacy features, he can implement it as a sidechain. Mm -hmm. um, the way or or the time when it's ready to decentralize it, to give it out to the people, mm -hmm. um, will definitely be when the SDK reaches a certain point of maturity and when the core is so damn stable and scalable, you know, yeah. that it supports like thousands of transactions per block, yeah. then we might give it out. Okay. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, as I said, it's open source. Everyone can fork the project and do his own chain. Um, but like in the in the first definite first five years we need to focus really hard on the products and to make them really nice is it more like that your core is like tightly controlled kind of really clean and simple but secure but like you can do all the experiment with the sidechain is that the like uh, your exactly. main idea? Okay. yes exactly like um side chains are extremely useful for experiments mm -hmm. because if you break a side chain you don't break anything else but of course, sidechains are also extremely good for real useful features later on. Mm -hmm. um, what we will definitely build later later mm -hmm. is an identity app. So if someone says, hey Max, why don't you integrate like an identity system mm -hmm. into the main chain? I say, no, listen, this would just clog up the main chain. It would make the core more complicated. We do it later on as a sidechain, just wait. We are here for a long, long time. We have now like $78 million in capital. Okay. We will build this project for years. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Mm. I think, yes. See, the thing is, you know, sidechains came out in like, what, 2000, 2013? Mm -hmm. And though, you know, I think, I think one of the weak 
biggest weaknesses people talk about side chains is how in the world are you going to get miners and at least in the original bitcoin iteration mm -hmm. right how in the world are you going to get miners to secure the side chain yeah when yeah. It's, it's a big enough problem to secure the main yeah. bitcoin chain yeah. but then you guys have a like a delegated proof of stake problem so mm -hmm. how do you how do you realize what what was the realization where, where you said okay hey if i choose a delegated proof of stake I'll have I'll have less of a bigger less of a problem than if I choose side chains plus proof of work versus side chains versus DPoS. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you make that leap? Yeah. First of all, when you say side chains came out 2013, yeah. and it was maybe the idea, you yeah, know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes <laughs> course, it, it takes years to implement an idea. Yeah. Um, with proof of work, I think there was a solution with merge mining where you're mining basically the side chain and the main chain yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Um, but I'm not a big fan of mining. Um, we, we implemented delegated proof of stake because of several reasons. Um, and one of these reasons is that it will be much, much easier to just find a few delegates renting like a $20, $30 note um, and this way securing a sidechain. Mm -hmm. A sidechain often, in, in the most cases, will also not require heavy computation. Mm -hmm. That means you might even be able to run two or three sidechains on one node. Um, and if a sidechain becomes very popular, um, that means the, the amount of transaction grows or computation grows, then you need to ramp up your server and probably just run one chain per server. Um, but with Proof of stake or delegate proof of stake, you definitely remove like the high cost factor of securing a chain mm -hmm. and also the the high entry barrier. Mm -hmm. Buying a miner or switching your entire infrastructure from one blockchain to another, which might not even be that that profitable, um, is another effort than just renting a server and installing the sidechain or main chain on it within a few seconds. Mm -hmm. We saw it I think recently with Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash that the um, the profit being for because of like um, the difficulty adjustments on, in Bitcoin Cash mm -hmm. the profits which were possible were sometimes enormous in Bitcoin Cash yeah. and then the miners were switching all right yeah. and it was like it's like, like a binary chart mm -hmm. where like 80% of the on the one and then 20% on the other and then it switched and back and forth and we luckily don't see that with delegate proof of stake. Yeah, I mean, people were gaming the, still now, people are still gaming the mm -hmm. heck out of like Bitcoin Cash. And like, that's the biggest problem. It kind of takes the whole meaning of um, having, like, yeah, I mean, having even the difficulty, the difficulty adjusting algorithm. Like, I mean, that basically broke the system. Yeah. So I'm like, maybe the, I'm just not curious. I'm, I'm just not familiar with this. Mm -hmm. So let's say, um, I'm a regular person running my node, um, main Lisk node, right? Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, simultaneously, if I, I can also be running another node to secure a side chain. So mm -hmm. I can also si simultaneously run a side chain node. Yes. And what what would I need to pay for it? Would I just need to stake some more, some more Lisk? Um, so for the main chain, you don't need to pay any, or you don't need to stake any coins. Mm -hmm. What what you need to do is you are collecting votes by other people yeah. on the network. Um, basically, everyone who holds the Lisk token, um, let's say he owns one token, yeah. has one vote. Mm -hmm. If he owns 100 tokens, mm -hmm. he owns 100 votes. Okay, And now he can vote for so-called delegates, which are registered accounts on the network. Um, and those delegates which receive the most votes, and by voting you're not sending the money to him, you just um, basically pegging your number of votes to his account. Yeah. Um, That's just like NS NXT, right? Um, in good. NXT there are no delegates. Uh -huh. um, there it's not a vote, it's just how much money you own in your own account. Oh, okay. okay. You can yeah. also, basically you can also rent it out, your own stake okay, to okay, others yeah, and yeah, it yeah. becomes similar, yeah. but there are no registered delegates. Um, and so in the, in, uh, in the LISC consensus algorithm, those delegates with the most votes 101 of them um, become active delegates and they're generating new blocks. Yeah. And a sidechain, if the sidechain would use delegate proof of stake as well, it would be very similar. 
Um, but of course you could also change the system on the sidechain. You could run a regular proof of stake like NXT has it as well. Mm. Uh, but can, like, you have sidechains and then you said previously the sidechain can implement its own consensus mm. algorithm, right? What if sidechain implements the proof of work? Mm. It's like, still, is it, like, is it gonna work? Well, yes. Um, it better would then have its own hashing function because mm -hmm. else someone just points a few minor to it and right. um, creates a 51% attack. Right. Um, but of course you could also implement proof of work into the sidechain. Uh -huh. You could even probably like merge mine it with the Bitcoin blockchain then. Um, but I think no one's going to do that because proof of work in my opinion is obsolete. Right. Okay. Um, and it's just not efficient enough and easy enough for a sidechain. Uh -huh. um, I mean, of course, if you implement nice incentive structures into a huge, huge sidechain, mm -hmm. which did an ICO where it collected millions and there, the miners are all jumping onto it, then it will work. Okay. But is it really the best system? I don't believe that. Okay. Then what is the main function, functionality of the main chain? Mm -hmm. what, what, what's its role? Yes. Um, so we already um, said earlier that the main chain is like the super lean yeah. and simple mm -hmm. um, version of a blockchain with not many features. Right. Basically what it is, is that the main chain is some sort of a mother chain, okay. uh, which all the side chains connect to. Right. Um, that means it acts somehow like a basis of the whole platform. Mm -hmm. You can send transactions on it back and forth to other users. You can register your own side chain on it. You could initiate a transaction to a sidechain to transfer tokens to it. Um, later on, we're also going to implement like ICO mechanisms so that you can issue your own token on the main chain, um, do an ICO with it and distribute it to your investors and then you develop your sidechain and then you can transfer later on the token to the sidechain. Um, when, I, when I'm talking about transferring or sending to a sidechain, it's more like a replication where it gets locked on the main chain, created on the sidechain, where you can then again freely send it around. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to send it back or withdraw it from the sidechain, then you basically destroy them and unlock them again on the main chain. Mm -hmm. um, and that means the main chain acts as an in-between settlement layer. Also, of course, you could also register delegates and so on, but that's for the consensus on the main chain. Okay. Uh, the main chain maintains the blockchain. The main chain yes. is a blockchain, yes. and it is the blockchain of LISC itself. And then, like, let's say it's in the middle, right. and then you can create new blockchains, yeah. a sidechain, right. which are running independently, mm -hmm. but which have a link to the main chain. Okay. So you could potentially list all sidechains in existence um, because every sidechain has a registration on the main chain. This means an entry in the main chain, in the main yeah. blockchain. Yeah, so the then state of the sidechain is committed to the main blockchain? Um, potentially that would be possible. Okay. Um, it has some scalability um, problems if you now have 10,000 sidechains and they're right. all reporting yeah. back. Yeah. So this would have to be involved, involved with a fee. Mm -hmm. um, and that would mean you could secure the sidechain onto the main chain by, like, let's say, take a block, mm -hmm. save as hash yeah. on the main chain, and this would fix this block in time. Mm -hmm. um, I personally believe that it's not necessary mm -hmm. um, as long as the sidechain is big enough to um, attract enough delegates, forgers, miners, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why did. Okay. Why do you think. Um, you know, I, I remember there used to be a time, even even like when I got into Bitcoin, mm -hmm. side chains used to be like the like a buzzword. Yeah. Like everybody was talking about like Still. having <laughs> parallel chains. But then like now you have like other scaling solutions, mm -hmm. right? like like network grade and plasma sharding, mm -hmm. Cosmos with their with their Cosmos hub, and then also uh, block strip. Oh, and then Polkadot with their pair chains. Like, mm -hmm. Why do you, why do you think? That kind of died out. Side chains died out for a short second there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I started. I started picking up the side chain white paper again. Yeah. Just because of Lisk. Yeah. Um, so I don't know so much about Polkadot's para chain. Yeah, para chain. Um, but 
if you take a look at, for example, Raiden, mm -hmm. Lightning, mm -hmm. um, and these others, Plasma, yeah. um, and pro probably also the solution Cosmos has to offer, yeah. it's that they're basically outsourcing it from the main chain, right? Um, they're putting it into state channels, payment channels, side chains, or these other chains you just named. Mm -hmm. um, I think the blockchain space in itself has a problem of too much theory. Um, there are just many mathematical people in the space mm -hmm. and they just <laughs> love to create white papers, you know, but they don't love to actually work on on the on the solution they describe for a problem. Yeah. They just they just write the stuff down, you know? Yeah. And think about all the mathematical implement, uh, implications and so on and so forth. You studied math as well, right? Yeah. Um, you, might, <laughs> <laughs> you might I love theory. It I love theory. Um, yeah. and I think there was just no one who picked it up yeah. and realized it, you know, do it. Um, we 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 knew the concept since a long time, mm -hmm. right. and we think it's a great system. Mm -hmm. We also think there's not the scaling solution. Mm -hmm. It's more like you at one point probably have to implement, implement many different scaling solutions to um, reach this point of scalability, yeah. which is enough. Um, but it's one, and it's an easy, relatively easy one um, in terms of scalability because you split the data yeah. um, into multiple blockchains. So it's just a logical one. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the people in the space are too intelligent that for them it's just too easy of a solution. Why split it into multiple blockchains if you could like split the data amongst millions of nodes or whatever, you know, yeah. like sharding is doing. Um, so that not every node sees every kind of data. Mm -hmm. um, they probably think like, oh, let's better focus on more complicated solutions than grabbing the easy fruits first. Mm -hmm. But um, we think actually it's an amazing way in the beginning and then you can implement the other scaling solutions individually on the sidechain. I think though another, another argument that people would make is, you know, like Bitcoin, I mean, I heard this from a and Andreas, Andreas talk, but like the whole thing yeah. of like, Bitcoin already set sail and it's in the middle of the ocean and it's weathering the storm, and all the other all the other uh, ch blockchains, they haven't set sail yet. You know they're okay. they're chilling at the port. So yeah. you just haven't maybe some some will say Lisk just just hasn't gotten to that size mm -hmm. where you have to start like really thinking about scalability real time, and then yeah. you'll have all these scaling options and you have to pick you have to kind of pick which one is the best one for me to implement at this current mm -hmm. moment. I think if you um, are at the point where you have to think about scalability, it's already too late. Oh. Um, you think about scalability before, you know. Mm -hmm. um, for example, Lisk artificially limits the number of transactions to 25 per block. Yeah. Um, and we're not at the point where we have to scale it up. At this point, we could easily scale it up massively already, but we don't see the need. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of scalability, it's always something where you want to have a leeway to. You don't want to reach the tipping point. If you do, it's too late already. Um, and I agree that Bitcoin is sailing in the sea already. Yeah. Um, but so is Ethereum, Dash. You know, there are many blockchain projects out there with significant um, transaction volume and amount of transactions. Mm -hmm. And I don't know from when the speech is. Yeah. Uh, I admire him, so it might be a little bit older already. Um, but by now, middle or towards the end of 2017, it's definitely not true anymore. Okay. Uh, my question is that you said like the, there are a lot of, of academic research on scalability solutions, right? Mm -hmm. But there's not really a the solution that stands out, um, which has been implemented, right? So. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it, it seems like there's a really high barrier for actual implementation of those solutions. What, what do you think is the biggest obstacle for implementing those scalability solutions, mm -hmm. particularly, particularly the sidechain? What are the major obstacles that you, you will face when you're implementing your sidechain? Um, so first of all, in general, mm -hmm. um, relatively less ability, mm -hmm. um, but I think we're gonna, it's, it's a mix, right? Um, and at one point, we probably um, will see that it might just be a, a combination of all of them plus 
increasing hardware capacity mm -hmm. to really just reach the level of scalability which is sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, but yet again, you could also argue um, that an application could get so many users that scalability never stops. It has right. to scale up unlimited. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot the second question or the later part. Okay. Oh, what what is the what in your opinion? What is the main what will be the major obstacle mm -hmm. um, to actual implementation of your site plan? Mm -hmm. As a side not side chain side chain. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm not worried about it. Um, okay, so I think the biggest problem will be forks. So on the main chain, yeah. um, you're at block one million, okay. and on the side chain, you're on block two hundred, mm -hmm. and now you're going. Okay, mm -hmm. the blockchains keep going. And suddenly, some, or, or someone sends a transaction to the sidechain, mm -hmm. uh, it re registers it, creates a token on the sidechain, and on the main chain, the fork just happens a little bit after, mm -hmm. and the whole blockchain moves back mm. um, behind the point where it transacted to the sidechain. Mm -hmm. But the sidechain doesn't know it. So the token exists on the sidechain, mm -hmm. but on the main chain, the user also has it. So yeah. there's a mismatch, okay? Um, so like, that's it's like a double spend. Absolutely. Basically, yes. So, so more, uh, that's like main chain side chain. Yes, so that's in my opinion the biggest obstacle for side chains. Mm -hmm. um, there are different solutions for that. Um, like you could always have like an atomic um, swap. Mm -hmm. um, that means someone is actively selling it yeah. and buying it on one of the of the chains. Um, but it's also a matter of how long you wait. If you're doing an amazing main chain which is super stable mm -hmm. and which has like very reliable delegates in our case, mm -hmm. then such a long rollback will not happen. So you just mentioned you got your sidechain paper out. Mm -hmm. um, so if I remember correctly, it says like you have to wait one or two days yeah. if you send it in and then mm -hmm. another one or two days. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is, of course, a huge amount of time. Yes, right. um, I think with list we don't have to wait so long. Um, in the beginning, we will probably just make it extremely long just for security reasons. Um, but I mean, once you're on the sidechain, you're on the sidechain. So potentially, an exchange could just say, okay, we accept the token from the, from the main chain and from the sidechain. Problem solved. So if someone wants to sell it on an exchange, on a centralized exchange, you would not have to send it back. For mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. um, so it's not a huge problem to, like, that it takes like one day or two days to send a token to a sidechain yeah. to make really sure that there's no rollback happening, okay. um, because two days, two day rollbacks will never happen. Yeah. So you, you made a very very interesting point about the um, inverted incentive for core development. So mm -hmm. core is probably the more important now, but like there's less development. Mm -hmm. Talent going into the core development, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So I just want to know, like, how can you in in the Lisp platform? How can you incentivize those core developers to contribute to the core, uh, Lisp core? That's right. And how many, how, how many, how much, how many percentage of your development team is spending time on the core? Mm -hmm. Let me get the second one first. Mm -hmm. um, so one, two, three, four, five. Six. So we have five backend developers, mm -hmm. one system architect mm -hmm. on the core, mm -hmm. and of course then DevOps Q and A very very soon, um, and um, they're all spending exclusively their time on core. Mm -hmm. But it's not enough yet. We want more. We need more right. um, because the testing takes quite long to write the tests and to um, peer review all the code yeah. um, and how to incentivize that. So basically five developers exclusively on core and backend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and how to incentivize them, um, well a good salary, mm -hmm. an amazing team culture, um, an amazing office and a nice list bonus <laughs> <laughs> over which is being paid out over years. Okay. Um, and that gives a pretty good incentive, mm -hmm. but this is just like objectively like monetary. Mm -hmm. um, I think the best developers, they don't do it solely for money, they mm -hmm. do it for a passion as well. Yeah, okay. And to be honest, like, I can't imagine a better job mm -hmm. than 
working on blockchain technology and if you're a JavaScript developer, Lisk is like your only option in this space, <laughs> only, only serious option. So um, it's like, it's a pretty good job, you know, and mm -hmm. they love it and I can fully understand that. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's not so hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Didn't Lisk have a, like a network halting problem? I don't mm -hmm. know if it's a forking problem, network halting problem. Mm -hmm. Didn't you guys have that one time? Yeah, we had it. That's, that's the only serious problem that you ever encountered. It's not so serious in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. um, it's I just serious. bad PR. Uh, serious enough for you to make a blog post about it. <laughs> yeah, of, of course. We are fully transparent. We yeah. don't uh, say, oh no, this never happened. We yeah. are transparent. We have a non-profit and we always do as much as possible to stay transparent, you know, yeah. so of course we issue blog posts about that. Um, so what, what happened? Yeah, so um, first of all, um, it was a halting of the blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, and this is super bad PR, it's super bad marketing, <laughs> Thomas would agree to that. Um, but like, it's in itself not a huge problem in a project which is really early stage. Um, because it just means that the blockchain stops, it stops at one specific block height mm -hmm. and then we would have to fix the bug, release a new version, um, the delegates have to run it and install it on the nodes mm -hmm. and then the blockchain keeps going again. Yeah. Um, and it's very normal that a very early product has some bugs, you know. Yes. Um, that's why we are focusing so much time on tests, on, on, on tests like unit tests, functional tests, behavioral tests. Um, and on quality assurance to make sure that there are as few bugs as possible, but while well, it's software written by humans. Mm -hmm. um, it's good that it stopped and not forked, because that means all funds are safe, um, and in our case it always stopped, you know. Um, I mean, there are constantly some rollbacks with a few blocks, but that's normal, that's why we always say, okay, please wait like for six blocks, exchanges have like 100, 300 Poloniacs, I think, has 300 um, confirmations required yeah. um, to accept a transaction. Um, but like small rollbacks always happen in a blockchain. It always finds a yeah. way, right? Um, like one or two blocks. Um, and that's not a problem. If there would be a huge rollback, of course, that would be a real, real problem. And what happened basically is just um, that there was a bug which crashed um, a node. Yeah. And basically, this bug was being um, created by a transaction. And now we had a node here, and it was forwarding this transaction to another node, mm -hmm. and it received it and crashed while verifying it or processing yeah. it. But it also sent it further. So it created like a, a chain reaction, and the whole network shut down basically. Um, but again, Within a few hours, we released a new version. That's the advantages of having a centralized team. Um, it's an advantage of having a team at all. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We issued the blog post to be transparent. Um, we openly communicated, and this was months ago. Yeah, I mean, yeah. To take, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I mean, Bitcoin had its fair share of um, accidental forks mm -hmm. in the past, and I think everybody, like, not, um, I mean. Now forks have become like it's basically become a swear word, you know. Like that's like the worst thing to say. Anytime mm -hmm. anyone suggests hard fork or even soft fork, everyone is like, "Oh my gosh, how can that happen?" Yeah, but only hard forks. Yeah, right? but um, it, but it happens. It happens. It happened during Big Bitcoin's time, and then I heard that developers stayed up and they communicated yeah. to each other to fix the problem. Yeah. Mostly, it's about hard forks, which um, not fix a bug, yeah. but which introduce something new. Yeah. Making it more complicated. Magic. Magic, <laughs> yes. Um, which are doing some crazy magic. Yeah, code magic. <laughs> um, but I think it's good to establish in the early days of a cryptocurrency, and early days for me is three years, because it's complicated technology, um, to establish a culture of hard forks. Yeah. Um, we call them upgrades, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and by establishing such an upgrade culture, the community accepts change and it should be because else technology can't move forward if mm -hmm. it doesn't change um we see it in bitcoin's case it's gold right but it doesn't really move forward i'm so glad that segregated witnesses the updates have been accepted with uasf yeah um and well 
I hope that in this case everyone will just accept the great things we're working on so passionately every day on. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you, I think it slightly touched on the very, very interesting topic of hardboard versus softboard. Is there any, like, say, which one is your, like, preferable option of, like, so evolving your blockchain platform? It's like, what are the um, case and benefits and what do you think is the like right sort of balance between those two? Mm -hmm. So a hard fork is just not backwards compatible. Mm -hmm. So if you don't, like, it often is being introduced with a milestone on a specific height. Mm -hmm. If you don't update, then you're landing on another um, road, another chain basically, a right. fork, right? Mm -hmm. um, depends on which side you're on. Um, and well, for me, like of course, a software, a soft fork is better because the implementation itself made it not necessary mm -hmm. to introduce a hard fork. Right. Um, like Segwit was a soft fork, right? right. Um, but just some other features made a hard fork out of it, or at least the, the um, assumption of it, um, like block. Increase, increase, block yeah. size increase. Um, I have no preference to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think both introduce new features to the system. Right. If it's possible to do it as a software soft fork, you should do it as a soft fork. But if it's not uh, not possible, then you just have to introduce a hard fork. Do, do you think um, hard fork is kind of like a necessary evil? <laughs> it's it's not an evil at all. <laughs> yeah. um, if you upgrade software yeah. in the way that you you put so much work into it that it got so much better that it has so many new cool features right. that it's just not backwards compatible anymore right. then it's good it's nothing right. bad but of course if you have to delete all transactions or make something what happened in the past um, like to put it back the action in the past yeah. then it's a hard fork which is a little bit shitty but sometimes also necessary but like the thing is like um, uh, even the new cool features that mm -hmm. requires hard fork, mm -hmm. um, it, it, we we're kind of saying that like it is really hard to reach a consensus mm -hmm. uh, for even a very yeah. very cool features, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, my question is so that uh, it, it, you you think there there's features that you think is really cool, but mm -hmm. it's not um, accepted by some it's like quite minority. Of the participant, and so it's not moving forward. I mean, so what do you think? What do you think? Think is the most like, um, so yeah, it's kind of. I guess I, okay. Right. Tell me if this is right. Like, yeah. there's a way to phrase that. Like, how do you get your delegates to cooperate during upgrades? Mm -hmm. Is that is that, that, the, is that the kind sense, of question? Right? Yeah, I think if if the upgrade is conten contentious, right? Mm -hmm. Not every upgrade can be sort of like smooth and get the majority of the uh, majority consensus. Right. Yeah. Even 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 though it's super cool. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think we have one of the fastest upgrade cycles in the or update cycles in the industry. Mm -hmm. After four hours, five hours, every delegate has updated, and hundreds of nodes oh. as well. Um, wow. Mainly, it's because delegates earning a lot of money and they don't want to miss it, um, but also because people believe in what we're building um, and they are expecting and looking forward to any small update being introduced to the system. Mm -hmm. um, for example, in Bitcoin's case, there's no leadership involved, you know, that it's a complete decentralized project and there's a group of people which were just, um, which just evolved into being this group publishing Bitcoin co-releases, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the case of Lisk, there's a whole legal foundation behind it, a whole team um, founders and they are pushing it forward how they see it fit, how they see it right. Mm -hmm. If people don't agree with the vision, they can fork off the project and create a, create a, create a copycat. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in this case, for example, well, there are many, many good reasons to follow the, the right chain mm -hmm. because we have the funding, we have the team to make it reality, to make it a great project. Mm -hmm. And at this stage, it's like so early if right. someone doesn't agree to what we are implementing at this stage, then there will be hundreds of occurrences <laughs> later down the road. You know, uh -huh. I think that's awesome because, yeah, you're. I mean, you, I mean, it's 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 a double edged sword. I think mm -hmm. I think those hardcore everything should be on the protocol, done algorithmically. Those people mm -hmm. are gonna hate 
Yeah. Are you gonna yeah. hate delegated proof of stake? Just the yeah. social variable there is such a it's just just such a random variable, mm -hmm. right? You it brings in all the goods and all the evils from past institutions that we've seen mm -hmm. onto the blockchain. But mm -hmm. but I I, I I read somewhere that you guys are planning to change your consensus algorithm yeah. later on in yeah. the future that you yeah. might be considering other ones and yeah. and in terms of like the social aspect like where is your end state like where do you guys see like at the very very end of your mm -hmm. five phase mm -hmm. roadmap first of all about these hardcore people who yeah. want everything algorithmically solved i think there needs to be there need to be a currency which delivers that and i hope that bitcoin is that currency mm -hmm. like a digital gold people can always rely on yeah. which introduces updates nearly never you know yeah, yeah. which just runs um but for many other blockchain projects it's still too early mm -hmm. maybe in a few years they can demand it but not in an alpha or beta <laughs> stage problem like yeah. uh it, it's too soon um about your other part yes we are thinking about changing the consensus algorithm, it's yeah. very likely that it will evolve. It's not like a radical change from A to B or from black to white. It's more like it will evolve and after several steps it will very likely be completely different. Yeah. Um, but um, we will likely work, start working on actual implementations somewhere in the middle of 18. Yeah. Um, because it's working, it's running, um, we don't see a big need to change it at this point mm -hmm. um especially with uh with uh, delegate forging rewards soon dropping by 20 yeah, percent yeah um in bitcoin case the price always shoot to the moon uh looking forward just economically um to what happens in this case mm -hmm. um about the social question of how far do we want to take it with the social element yeah um so I think it's great to have a social element in a social blockchain. Mm -hmm. So I said like Bitcoin has to be this algorithmic, uh, diff difficult word, algorithmically yeah, yeah. Um, solution which people can just trust. They just trust mathematics, they just tr uh, trust the underlying system. Mm -hmm. It can't introduce a social element. Mm -hmm. But we are not trying to be that kind of a, of a system, we are trying to be a project built for people to get introduced to blockchain development and which should come up with great use cases um, and there's always some kind of a social system involved yeah. um, and I think we don't want to take it too far but the way it is right now it's quite good you have these um, these federated these delegates um, this federates these delegates in the system which can be anonymous which can be known um, but they are real people you know it's not like um, just some miner running somewhere mm -hmm. um, and it's one of 10,000 miners in a huge hall yeah. it's always a real person taking care of the delegate and we were just in China we met like 10 people there 10 delegates or 8 delegates something like that and it's been amazing, you know, it was real people um, who were taking care of the nodes and yeah. you saw their passion and their belief in the system mm -hmm. and you saw really that they were like regular people, yeah. you know, yeah. not some sharks or whatever, but just normal people mm -hmm. who are supporting a living network. Yeah. And I think that's great. How can, so yeah, how can um, regular everyday, I mean, is it is it hard to run a node? No, it's not. Um, it's not hard to run, but it's hard to master it. Mm. Um, at the current time, it's just like setting up a node, typing in a few commands because we made it super easy. Isabella did a great job on the deployment script here. Um, and that's it. Yeah. And it's so stable, you just need one node and that's like it's running for weeks. Back in the day, super early stage, people came up with like failover scripts yeah. where you ran like three notes and when one crashed or whatever it switched oh wow. and this was a case like once maybe every week or so yeah and now it's just running for months and no problem at all oh, as long as the computer's on it's just on yeah, yeah exactly Damn. um we are linux unix only mm -hmm. so not for windows um because servers are running in most cases a unix based operation of system course. yeah um and what i meant with hard to master is 
like there will be a time where there will be so many transactions on the main chain like hundreds and thousands you know maybe millions every day um, where you need quite powerful hardware mm -hmm. and quite secure hardware that means hardware which is being protected from DDoS attacks, yeah. hardware which is being um, so powerful that it can sustain this mass of transactions. And then it will become, it's already a business, but then it will definitely become a business. Yeah. Right now the delegates are earning like 70, 80 thousand dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And I think later on at this point they will earn maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. And that means it evolves into a real business. Yeah. We gotta become a delegate. <laughs> yeah, you should. Sure. Become a delegate for all these de uh, deep, sure. deep cost chains. <laughs> yeah. Right. How do you? But how do you stop? How do you stop delegates from colluding? What do you mean with colluding? Like, you know, for delegates to work in the benefit for the benefit of each other, or would you view that as them working for the benefit of the Lisk chain? Yeah. So they're already working together. Yeah. Um, trading votes with each other. Um, campaigning together like with banner campaigns like two three delegates putting money together starting a campaign together um, so that's already happening but yeah they're doing it in order to stay there and they have like the biggest incentive of everyone to just keep going you know with the blockchain because they're earning a lot of money with it mm -hmm. and this will still be the case until we let the consensus algorithm evolve mm -hmm. um, and even then, the incentive will, of course, be super strong. Um, and that's why it's so secure, you know? Mm -hmm. Would you give up on $80,000 a month? Oh, hell no. You see? And sounds pretty good. Yeah, and that's like 101 people saying, hell no, yeah, you know? Yeah. But here's the, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. so it, but because Delegate will have this economic incentive to try really hard to get the vote, mm -hmm. so and they, you said they're campaigning, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it sounds for me like like a it's a, uh, election campaign mm -hmm. in current political sort mm -hmm. of. A, it's similar, yeah. Yes. It's like, mm -hmm. So and then, I mean, the voters are economically incentivized by the delegate. So I think isn't it like mm -hmm. a, a delegate explicitly buying the vote from the people yes, and then populism. Yeah. So how, maybe you can you, you might. Mm -hmm. You might see some of the uh, sort of corruptions and some of the bad things that is being done in politics to be um, to, to be the same mm -hmm. in those kind of like mm -hmm. system dynamics. Mm -hmm. So what you mean is that delegates are giving back forging rewards to yeah. voters in order to incentivize them to keep on voting for yeah, them, you see, right? Yeah, it sounds like if I get elected, I'm gonna I'm gonna if you vote for me, I'm gonna give up yeah. like one dollars each for all of my support. Yeah, and that is happening. Right. Um, in most cases, they just make it dependent on how many votes you have and giving to the, to the delegate. Mm -hmm. um, basically, everywhere you see corruption, you know, and in the whole blockchain space, you see like all these uh, corruptions, but also economic crisis, the patterns, trading patterns, everything what happens in the real world also happens in the blockchain world. Right. on a smaller scale. Right. It's just, I think, a basic law of the universe that these things happen basically, okay. um, or at least on this planet. Right. Um, and, well, the world still keeps running, right? right. Um, Bitcoin keeps running even though there's huge corruption being involved there every day, unfortunately. Um, so, yes, it happens, right. but it doesn't destroy the system. Because yeah. again, they are incentivized Right. to keep it going so it's like a self-balancing system right. if some corruption goes too high yeah. or some problem grows too high um, the system will automatically balance it out by kicking maybe the delegate out right. um, the number one delegate I think has around 30% of votes it means 30% of the whole network wow. voted for him wow. um, don't know exactly the number of the last one maybe 16% or so okay. but that means in the case of number one, there's 70% left, and in case of number 101, there are like over 80% left. Yeah. To kick them out, you know? So if it really becomes a problem, then the whole community, all list holders can um, get together and do something. Yeah, I mean, but like, that's the, uh, I think it is directly related to the criticism of 
Deepa's being too social because mm -hmm. you kind of like depend on the assumption that people will sort of uh, um, kind of find the right balance for the system. But like if if it, uh, if the blockchain whole point of blockchain is to try to minimize the um, human intervention mm -hmm. when reaching a consensus, um, isn't it might be if is isn't Deepa's too social or yeah so yeah. Um, the whole point of proof of work yeah. is to minimize social interaction right. not yeah. of people's you know right um, then the point is to implement some social aspects um, because um, people will always try to save their asses you yeah. know and um, that's like part of human nature right. um, and well, yes, I, I tend to agree that maybe the social element is a little bit too strong mm -hmm. and it will probably evolve into a consensus algorithm where the social element is not that strong. Okay. But for now, it's totally working fine. And right. uh, the price is a little bit too high for my taste. Uh, didn't expect that to happen so fast. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how it is and it seems to still work great, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's just because the incentive is so high. Right. Yeah, in any case, I think it's a great like, and exciting experiment. Yeah. 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 How you see how, how people react and how, like, what kind of economy is, is kind of like forming out of that. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, um, we are now like one and a half years old approximately, right. and Ethereum is much, much older right. in blockchain terms. Um, and some people from Ethereum still say that Ethereum is one huge experiment. Yeah. Um, sure. A social experiment, a technical experiment, and I say the same about Lisk. Mm -hmm. I would say we are like somehow in the better stage of it, mm -hmm. um, with our main product not even released yet. Mm -hmm. So people should not expect something finished. Mm -hmm. They should expect an experiment at right. this stage, yeah. which evolves to become an amazing product in mm -hmm. the future. Mm -hmm. But at this time, it's still high risk and high reward. Right. In your opinion. What's a healthy node ecosystem? Like, <laughs> I, I mean, I was just listening to you talking in some ways, you know, some people might say, oh, but everybody should at least get one chance to be a delegate, mm -hmm. you know, to, to taste that 80 <laughs> grand a month or something. So every, every, like, I don't know, I don't know if you're good in cycles, like almost like terms, like every three months, you should always have a revote of all the delegates and then everybody will get a fairer, dis fairer distribution of the chances or, mm -hmm. Or even like, you know, another thing is okay. Fine, you 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 realize that maybe like up to, from one to one hundred twentieth uh, top nodes, right? That get the votes, they're always gonna do it because they they get a chance to you know pay some of that money. But you know, if this continues, you can actually imagine the nodes, the full nodes, actually shrinking, right? There's mm -hmm. a possibility that they might shrink because the in terms of economic incentive. If I can never ever be a delegate, then what's the point of me trying? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, what do you think about it? So, all these crazy um, examples of like um, revoting every three months <laughs> yeah. or so, it's, it's quite dangerous okay. because if people don't revote, the whole security of the system goes down. Okay. Basically, now with 30% on. Uh, for the first delegate, it becomes more and more and more secure over time because more and more people vote. They they figure out, oh wait, what is this voting? Oh, I can earn some LISC with it, oh, so okay. I will do it. Or they're extracting the LISC from exchanges and see this feature and just start doing it even though they knew it from the beginning. Um, so there are many use cases where people just find out about this voting aspect that means more more LISC in general are voting. That means the whole thing becomes more secure. Um, that's very that's that's really interesting. Um, but but it also becomes more rigid, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But I mean, if it's running great, it's running great. And at one point, as I said, we will change it. Yeah. And then it won't be a problem anymore. Yeah. And up to this point, I don't see a problem in it. Yeah, because even before you get there, you can imagine out of the hundred. Like you probably don't know whether the hundred and one nodes are all run by every single individual. Hundred and one mm -hmm. individual. There might be multiple individuals. There might be some person who owns like five nodes. Yeah, there might and be five, five delegates. Five delegates. Yeah. There might be, um, but I think I know nearly everyone. Nearly everyone. Not all, but nearly everyone. Interesting. For most of the past system, as far as I know, mm -hmm. they have a locking period, so you're very kind of like 
uh, like gets into effect like after a certain period of time. Yeah. And it gets invalidated after mm -hmm. a certain period of time. Right? So there are 101 delegates, um, a block time of 10 seconds mm -hmm. that makes a round through all these 101 delegates approximately like 16, 17 minutes long. Mm -hmm. um, if you are now voting within this round for a new delegate, okay. the changes will only um, put into effect, effect um, once the current round is finished. Okay. So every 16, 17 minutes, it like checks what is the current um, state of votes and it will change it. Okay? Right, okay. So in the worst case, that's like 101, 100 blocks. And then the best case, that's like zero, one block, you know? Okay. So it's like a very, very sort of quick sort of turnover. Yes, um, but within one round, you could vote for one and then remove immediately in the next block the vote again. Mm -hmm. And it would not change anything because mm -hmm. the change will just be registered at the end of the round. Right. And then it's always the, the state at this point, you know? Okay. Right. Okay. How do you... Uh, and this is a problem that I see with all deep pause systems. How do you tackle Matthew's effect? Mm -hmm. Where the rich get richer and the poor mm -hmm. just continue to get poor. Mm -hmm. So first of all, this seems to be like a normal element <laughs> in this world. So if you have even, money, in, even with proof of work. Even, even with no proof offs, you know, yeah, in, yeah. The, in the real world outside, yeah. um, the rich get richer. Um, but in, in this case, um, it's delegate proof of stake. So it's not necessarily the rich get richer, it's the the most popular ones get rich. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. not that you need a lot of money, you need a lot of votes. It's like high school, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. Yeah. If you're, not the, if you're not one of the cool kids, <laughs> forget about getting laid. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, delegating. Being a delegate is not the only way of making money, right? Yeah, it, is, it, it, it isn't, right? but um, I mean, being popular always helps, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah. it also helps it in LISC, help. and um, that means Matthew's effect doesn't doesn't catch here, doesn't grip here. Right. Um, but even though I, I still think it's normal, we yeah. see it in Bitcoin, the rich people in the beginning could buy more miners, they're getting more rich now, they can buy more miners with the money, they're getting more rich, you know, it's the same. Yes. Um, also, like, a few years ago, people who invested in real estate in some cities who mm -hmm. could invest, got more money now, and now they have even more money, which they can again put in other projects. Mm -hmm. So it's a normal spiral. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's unrealistic to think that somehow algorithms can solve all these things. I mean, if you let's say you have one hundred dollar, yeah, and you invest it, you make ten percent. You made ten dollars. If you have a million dollar, you invest it, you make ten percent. You have one hundred thousand dollars. It's normal. It's it's just what else you would have to create an unfair system where the rich get let get less. Yeah. You know. And that's not how the world works. Yeah, I think it's more like a problem of capitalism. Like, and the yeah. blockchain cannot solve it. Blockchain actually boosts like, <laughs> yeah. the, the capitalism. Yeah, right? yeah, definitely. Like, yeah, definitely. Okay, I think we've, we've talked enough about like deep parts and side chains. Uh, we know we know also talk about the leadership and governance, which mm -hmm. is really an interesting like point as well. So you've mentioned that the weak and strong leadership. So can you elaborate on this more, like when mm -hmm. the weak leadership is required and when the strong leadership is required? Mm -hmm. I mentioned it in our first interview, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think like what we at LISC are is that we are a startup. Mm -hmm. A startup always has strong leadership. Someone or two people who say where the ball is going, you know, yeah. where the project is, is uh, moving to. Um, and so I came originally from the Next or NXT community. Mm -hmm. and there was no leader at all. Mm -hmm. It was a completely decentralized project. The initial founder was anonymous and he ran away. Same as Satoshi Nakamoto <laughs> did it. His name was PC Next. Um, so no one, so, somehow no one really evolved to become like 
the leader. You know, there were some efforts. I I put a lot of work into it. I created like a next organization. Um, I created many efforts, many campaigns. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was not the leader of Next. You know, same same. Many other people did also a shit ton of work, but they were not leader. Um, and that means the project never went somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's it it succumbs. It's it 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 just fell down on coin market cap because there were no clear path they followed because everyone wanted something and they implemented everything okay. so it's just a mess you know um, with a very clear and strong leadership you can build this lean and useful platform mm -hmm. um, which attracts millions of people mm -hmm. mm. but this of course makes it mandatory that the leadership is a good leadership, mm -hmm. a strong leadership, that people trust and believe in this vision. Um, and I'm a big fan of it. Um, I think even decentralized projects, or maybe definitely decentralized projects, need this kind of leadership in the beginning mm -hmm. um, to really find their own ways. Um, else they will just give in to the many voices on the internet and this will definitely kill any project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's like it's really strongly based on your experience. With yeah, that, definitely. Like, so yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then, like, next follow-up question is like you said, like many people want different things. Mm -hmm. right? What are the criteria to decide which code to merge, which mm -hmm. code not to merge? Mm -hmm. So, how do you decide? Like, what are the priorities and kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. So, when we receive a pull request mm -hmm. um, in the middle of a sprint. Mm -hmm. um, Everyone is of course excited because everyone loves open source and they're like, cool, people are contributing. But then we are reminding them, hey guys, we are in the middle of a sprint. Put it on the backlog. Yeah. Okay, so it's on the backlog. Um, the sprint finishes and then we're taking a look at the backlog. Yeah. What is left? What do we need to do? Um, then we see, oh, there's this community pull request. Let's now take a look at it. So we never even took a deeper look into it, maybe we just read the headline, that's it. Um, and then we're analyzing it. What, it. what is it trying to solve? Mm -hmm. Are there enough tests? Is it good code? Um, does it make sense to mm -hmm. implement it? Mm -hmm. um, in most cases, maybe one of the four criteria are met um, because it's just very complicated to write good code. It's uh, nearly impossible to know where we are heading to um, in terms of these small details. Um, if we now need this API call or not, or if we now need this refactoring of this particular part of the code. Um, no developer likes to write tests, so th that's also often missing. Um, so it's very hard for us to accept the pull request and we really don't like to see that. Um, but it's just the harsh truth um, that we have these super high demands mm -hmm. and that it really has to fit all the criteria. We can't just merge something because we like the guy mm -hmm. or because we think the idea is great <laughs> even though no one needs it, you know? Right. Um, so we are really a startup. This is like something what people might not get sometimes. We are a startup and you're not like sending pull requests to Facebook or Google or <laughs> Instagram. Hey guys, I want this feature. Uh, I, oh, I wrote God. it for you. Just implement it. And if you don't implement it, I will fuck you guys. You know? <laughs> no, no one is doing that. So, yeah. so of course, <laughs> blockchain is important. like blockchain is like it's open source. It has this aspect. Oh God, yeah. Mainly also probably because Bitcoin had no strong leadership and no clear path or roadmap or so back in the days. Um, so people just assume it's with any new project like that, yeah. but we see it more and more P like the, the latest blockchain projects are real startups with funding, with a team, with a brand, with a vision and roadmap and they're, they need to align to that mm -hmm. and else it's just a mess. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so Ethereum has consensus, you know, and there are several Ethereum based development production studios mm -hmm. around the world other than consensus which are people who are very excited to build on this platform mm -hmm. get together they work in a company and they're basically working on all these different projects 
do you foresee something like that for Lisk in the future? Yeah, definitely. And how do you like? How do you see it coming about? Like, mm -hmm. like an organizational structure or? Mm -hmm. So the run on Ethereum shows that people want to build blockchain technology, mm -hmm. but they just couldn't do it. And the same, so they can now build smart contracts, okay? But they can't build their own blockchain because it's super complicated to do it from yeah. scratch. And when we release our SDK, it will become possible for the first time in history that one, two, three developers can build their own blockchain, that they can play around with it, that the university can experiment with different, let's say, consensus algorithms on a new blockchain. Um, in a way where everything is nicely encapsulated, wrapped in an SDK, and not like you could argue, yeah, you can just fork the Bitcoin code. Yeah. But this is like huge amount of, of code, and it's not done in a way that it's modular so that you can either replace different kind of functionalities or that you can actually go into the code and change things. Mm -hmm. It's just, a, it's like. It's crazy. Yeah, nobody okay. knows other than Greg Maxwell and, <laughs> yeah. and Co. <laughs> because they're in it since the beginning yeah. and they know it by heart, you know, yeah. and of course they know it really, really well, but people who now get into the space would have to spend months studying it. Um, and with the SDK, it's rather like you type in a few commands, you choose the libraries you want to use, and there's your sidechain, you know, and then you're implementing new features on top, like a new transaction type or logic. Um, so I definitely foresee um, the same thing happening with this. Yeah. We're already getting contacted by so many people that they want to build blockchain applications on the Lisp platform that they want to come up with their own sidechain. Yeah. Um, also, this light curve, mm -hmm. also found by Oliver and myself, mm -hmm. um, which is the contractor of the Lisp Foundation, which takes care of all the development and the marketing. Um, and well, we will definitely within Lightcurve be some kind of a consensus, some kind of an incubator yeah. where we will develop our own apps. Yeah. This is also one point of an incentivizing structure mm -hmm. where we make it possible for our team members later, later on to build their own startups and get help from us. Like, we know they know the code, right? They're the best in the field right. um, with the SDK later on. Right. So we will say, hey man, I, I think your, your idea is great. So, do you accept like this 50k as a seed investment? Um, we invested in your startup for like this amount of tokens mm -hmm. or shares, mm -hmm. um, and they can basically become entrepreneurs okay. uh, and repeat the Lisk story basically. Right. Um, so I foresee it definitely with Lightcurve and with many other people. Yeah, I think it's awesome because, I mean, just the nature of JavaScript, right? Mm -hmm. Very easy to write UI. User, user interface wise, you could create something very, very like comfortable. Mm -hmm. User experience wise, that's obviously going to translate over, but then now you're throwing it, um, developer experience, the mm -hmm. whole curve of uh, learning curve for developers to pick up this language and start programming. Yeah, definitely. I mean, not much will change for developers. It's just um, some principles in which blockchain technology is unique, mm -hmm. like you have an immutable database. Yeah. There's something new and some ways like uh, the code is being arranged, but at the end it's still just JavaScript code mm -hmm. and people are used to that, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, for example, in our case, a developer who's working on, on the core, yeah. on the list core, needs made, so he, at maybe week one or two, uh, like after one week or two weeks, he's get started, starting to get productive and after one or two months, he's in it. He doesn't need years, years of blockchain experience, which is, basically impossible to have. Yeah. He just needs to be talented, needs to have experience in JavaScript and Node.js, and then he needs to focus on the code and he gets it quite quickly, you know? It's not rocket science. Yeah. It's complicated, it's a lot of work, it's much more complicated to introduce updates, but it's not rocket science. Yeah. Seems like modular projects are the way, like modular programming, that's the way to go. Same thing with Tenderman, right? That whole thing of like, they wanted to build everything in terms of modules. Mm -hmm. It's definitely the right way to go. Um, this way you can later on maybe uh, set up teams working on specific modules or take the decentralized approach now, uh, what you mentioned earlier, and say, okay guys, we're done with the project. 
Um, you can now work on your own peer-to-peer -peer stack, you can now work on your own consensus algorithm, it's all modular, mm -hmm. um, and that's it, you know. We also plan um, to do some kind of an NPM for the SDK, mm -hmm. where basically um, every developer in the world can create his own modules, yeah. and maybe module A is better than module C in terms of efficiency and speed, so people will swap them out, introduce an update, and they didn't even write a single line of code. They just took an existing library from someone else. Mm -hmm. That's what people are doing in the JavaScript space since years, yeah. and we will definitely make use of that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I want to briefly talk about the uh, different implementation in different languages. So I think we briefly talked about this, but apparently the Ethereum has like a different uh, core implementation, mm -hmm. like Parity and Gas being the mm -hmm. prime examples. So, what do you think is the best sort of a uh, thing, like having different implementations mm -hmm. based on different languages, or like one single implementation with an authority? Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> I'm not the most technical person. Right. I'm an entrepreneur, uh -huh. and on, an entrepreneur always listens to people more intelligent than himself. Okay. Um, there are basically two camps. Okay. Mm -hmm. The I just call them like that um, because they're like the strongest in their voice. Right. Um, the Vitalik Buterin camp of saying, yeah, different implementations is good. Mm -hmm. And the Peter Todd camp, which says, no, it actually is bad. Mm -hmm. um, so Vitalik says more like, okay, by having multiple implementations, you actually see consensus failures by implementing it in different languages. So doing it again and again in slightly different ways. And Peter Todd says more like, by having different implementations, consensus failure is more likely and then the network would fork instead of just stop, mm -hmm. which is bad. I explained mm -hmm. that earlier. Um, I think he's right in that. Um, I tend more towards Peter Todd. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he is right. Um, I mean, we can't stop anyone of um, transitioning or porting over the list core from Node.js to C, C++, Rust or Go. Right. Um, but we at LISC, at the LISC Foundation, will definitely concentrate on one language. Mm -hmm. um, if we are talking about the SDK, I just mentioned this NPM-like um, portal of libraries for the SDK, I can see that developers likely will create different Im implementations in different languages, um, even if it's just for the fun. Mm -hmm. um, but that is less of a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just very focused in what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I think developers also need to be very focused. We are now 20 people, more, more than 20 actually. And even though we are like up to here in work, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just not feasible to split the whole team. You do it in, in JavaScript, you do it in C. Right. You know, it's, it's, it would create a lot of more problems than beneficial. Mm -hmm solutions. Okay. So I definitely tend more to Peter Todd, okay. um, but I say both ideas are sound, like both reasonings are sound, both are great minds, mm. um, brilliant minds, but yeah, the Peter Todd way is the list way. Yeah, but still, uh, I think it's vague. Someone comes to you and says, I'm going to just implement um, the list in Go language. Like yeah, right. yeah, it calls stop yeah. right? So yeah, and we happens, wouldn't right? we yeah. wouldn't stop it. Yeah. You know, um, I'm just I just think that we need to stay focused. Um, we do all, all our hiring on Node.js, right? Mm -hmm. okay. um, but someone else can do it, of course. But it will never reach this this point of maturity and quality we we are right. doing in JavaScript. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I got. I just have two more questions. How many questions you got left? Um, just, I don't know. Um, you yeah, you okay, asked. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I got, I got two more questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's um, give Max some time too. And this, order. this will be, this will be for like people, people watching at home mm -hmm. or wherever they're at. Mm -hmm. um, so in Korea, just little, little something about Korea. A lot of, a lot of, we get a lot of questions, but a lot of the questions that we get is like, either non-technical people saying, "Do we need to learn how to code?" or right. like. How much does it? How much does um, making a mining rig cost? You know, it's like we get those questions the most because mm -hmm. the image is that I really like blo blockchain tech. You know, I really like cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. and I want to contribute in some way. But it seems like the pe the only people that I see 
who are contributing and getting some sort of economic benefits are either the devs or the miners, and they mm -hmm. don't really see anybody else. So for Lisk, if regular people want to contribute to Lisk and get something out of it, what, what are some ways that you recommend? So I think, first of all, someone who asked how much does mining rig cost yeah. is not deeply involved yet. He has no <laughs> clue and he sees all the people making millions sure, on me sure. and he wants to be part of that, sure. of the money making machine. Um, I think, um, first of all, yes, my background is electrical engineering, but I dropped out of college for LISC and I never felt like an engineer. I felt more like a business person, a startup guy. Um, and I contributed so much to different projects in the space by doing marketing, by doing community management, by doing like business and operations, by um, going to conferences and doing PR, public relations work, you know. Um, there's Everyone can contribute. I know an artist, a painter, and he contributed by painting pictures of, of cryptocurrency symbols, you know. Yeah. Everyone can do his fair share of work, yeah. um, no matter what you're doing. Um, you could even, like, let's say you're, like, you're someone who's creating, let's say, tables. Yeah. You could support your local blockchain startups by giving them the best tables in the world, you know, yeah. for a discount or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Everyone yeah, yeah. can that contribute. Everyone can do something. Um, it's just the, the naysayers who say, oh, yes, I'm not a coder. I can't contribute in any way. Yeah. I'm, I'm talentless, you know. Um, I think you have to kind of break, break out of the box. Yes. And just do what you love. Yeah, but like try to see how it connects to cryptocurrency or your favorite project or something. Yeah, become entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurial. But there's know? a thing like if, if if you don't know how to code, there's some thing that is kind of I can do some stuff. I can just I can contribute to some extent, but I can. Uh, the impression is I can never get to the core, and mm -hmm. make the greatest sort of uh, impact. I yeah, but then so. that's more like greed like you you <laughs> want to get to like the most popular thing right but is it so bad to do marketing is it so bad to do community management right. no i think everyone has different kind of talents but also interests right. and if someone says oh i really want to go to the core then maybe in his heart or somewhere else he's a developer mm -hmm. so he should get started learning coding right. you know yeah um about this um Later on, um, so first of all, how people can contribute. Yeah, regular people. Yeah, regular people, everyone can contribute. Uh, they could like go to our Lisk chat, they could follow us on our social media channels, mm -hmm. um, they could help us with translations, with answering questions everywhere. So you, everyone can help. Um, it's just a matter of doing it. Like every single retweet, every single like on a Twitter post we are doing looks amazing, you know, like we are now <laughs> consistently getting like 300 retreats and this just looks so amazing to me. Um, our marketing team is doing an amazing job and now let's say there are hundreds of people who say, okay, I just, I just can't contribute a retreat. Yeah. Now we consistently have 400 retreats. Yeah. It looks even more amazing, you know, so everyone can do his fair share of work. Um, I just named a few things, but it's also about becoming creative um, and think about ways how you can contribute. I think yeah. if you come, you come up with something on your own, it's also something you either like or you know the best, yeah. you know? Um, and in terms of sidechain development, yeah. um, I, will, I foresee that in the future, 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 um, you can just click it together. You say this consensus algorithm, this peer-to-peer -peer stack, this and this and this and this, okay. deploy. It shouts out to some servers and you have your sidechain. But do you want that? I'm not sure, but it's yet to see for the future. Yeah, but what does what does the market want? What does the you know developers want? And um, yeah, so and then right here at the bottom we should have a link for that um, I love risk. <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> so that everybody knows that there's a very there's a very like a girl in Japan who loves, wow. absolutely adores Lisk and so everybody <laughs> on your team knows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every, everyone knows it basically. And all the fans um, I think I retweeted so. it. It's a great effort. Like that shows really everyone can contribute. Yeah. And she 
did it in a way that everyone saw it. Yeah. And I'll, I uh, now invited her to our meetup in Tokyo because yeah. she's from Japan. Yeah. Um, she needed like a few lists for that to be able to, to pay for the train ticket. Yeah, yeah. And I think she did a great job with that and yeah. why not support it, you know? Yeah. I think people with creative ideas mm -hmm. should be supported sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and this was definitely creative, yeah. you know? Okay, and final question is, mm -hmm. um, how can devs from different countries contribute um, what what are what are the first things that they can start contributing? Because mm -hmm. in Korea we do have a language barrier. There mm -hmm. is a language barrier, so it, it's hard for um, even if you're a JavaScript dev to you know to understand Blisk and to figure out everything. So mm -hmm. would the first very first step need to be documentation translation? So first of all, every JavaScript developer speaks a common language, well, yeah, JavaScript, true. right? Yeah. Um, I mean, developers, so I said it in the beginning a bit, like we are building a team, we are building the, the software in, in, in like the first and foremost way, okay, mm -hmm. like uh, in principle. Um, developers can contribute, or how, first of all, how, how can they get into it? Yeah. Yes, the documentation needs to be top notch. I think developers mostly know English, mm -hmm. in Asia maybe not so good because no. you probably have a lot of um, local resources in yeah, development. We do, we do. Um, I think if it's a good developer, he can definitely read the code and understand it. Um, we saw it in the past already mm -hmm. um, that people who barely speak English contributed with pull requests. That's great. That's um, great. I mean, the descriptions were then bad, but it doesn't matter. Code mm -hmm. is code, right? And good yeah. code is good code. Um, and we all, also, even though what I'm saying all the time, we accept many pull requests from the past already. So it's always a balance, right? Um, I think the best way how people later on can contribute is by writing modules for the SDK, by making things better and better, mm -hmm. um, by forking any product we have and just work on it and making it better and maybe creating like alternative systems um, for example an alternative user interface mm -hmm. um, we also really actively try to integrate developers into our community um, that's why we take on board this whole modular approach yeah um, even this key which is a command line command line uh, command line interface um, where you can use Lisp functionalities within the terminal um, even there you can write your own plugins mm -hmm. to extend the functionality. So you could say, yes, I keep it running and then I write a plugin which sends every 10 seconds a transaction to this account or to a random account. That's possible. You could write a plugin for that. So we're trying all kind of things where people can contribute in different ways yeah. as a developer. Yeah. So that are some things. If you're talking about like documentation being translated, man, it's really really hard to come up even with English documentation. Yeah. <laughs> That's like a really tough <laughs> Really topic. good documentation is hard to come across. Exactly, yes. Um, and that's why again focus, we focus on English um, and try to get it right there for us yes, and then maybe we can try it out to mm -hmm. port it over to our other languages. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Wow, man, we covered a lot, I guess. Yeah, yeah it's also did. quite late already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I think we need to wrap it up. <laughs> okay, so uh, please tell viewers like what they can expect from Lusk, uh, like in the future. I mean, mm -hmm. if you can tell them like your briefly about your future plans. Yes, then. sure. So um, currently we are um, with we, I mean Thomas and myself, are uh, in Korea. Next target is Tokyo, Japan. Mm -hmm. After that, we will be in Mumbai. India, um, Korea, Japan and India are first time market entries basically. Um, so you can expect more activity within these countries in the future. Um, then our upcoming rebranding which is introducing a whole new user interface design, brand positioning, user experience for for basically all graphical user interfaces we have. Website, Explorer, Lisk Nano, um, and um, uh, so it's, yeah, that's about it. Um, and of course the logo, the logo was the one <laughs> I forgot. Um, but the name will change. Uh, uh, will will, change will, no, 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 it's too late already. The, will, the name will not change. 
Um, so that's one of our major things upcoming. Yeah. Maybe to um, just quickly explain what Lisk is doing at the end of this, uh, <laughs> like, I don't know, two hour interview or so in the middle of the night here in Korea with strong, strong jet lag. Um, so Lisk is a platform which enables JavaScript developers to create their own blockchain applications. Mm -hmm. We achieved that by developing an SDK which makes it simple, which makes it easy for a developer to handle blockchain technology. Um, around that, of course, we are building a platform. So we will basically take a developer by the hands or an entrepreneur or whatever you are. Um, we will inspire you. We will give you the necessary tools to come up with whatever you're dreaming about doing in the blockchain space. And we will help you out. We will support actively the project. We will help out with marketing and so on later on as well. Um, we have written in JavaScript. We started out 2016. We currently have um, a funding of approximately $78 million um, and did um, just recently a major push in hiring. Um, I mentioned it a few times during the interview. We are now 20 people um, sitting in Berlin, Sony Center, in four offices in WeWork, um, but quite close, of course. Basically, we want to make a difference in this world mm -hmm. by just making blockchain technology accessible for the regular developers. Um, we think the technology itself is great. It's a paradigm shift. Um, and we really want to see more experimentation happen. We really want that developers can play around with it, mm -hmm. create amazing ideas, create cool startups, which evolve into powerful corporations later on, and this all running decentralized. Um, we are big supporters of this idea of a trustless network, of a decentralized network, and LISC is our way how we help out to achieve a future which is decentralized mm -hmm. yep all right um, yeah. how can people contact you what are some mm -hmm. of your social media handles yes um, so first of all our website is www.lisk.io um, the Lisk social media handles are Twitter Lisk HQ Facebook Lisk um, Reddit no Facebook is also Lisk HQ Reddit is Lisk um, you can contact us on our website, either with the support center, if you have a question uh, or a problem with our products. Um, if you have a business inquiry, you can contact us with the contact us form on the footer of the website. Me personally, my Twitter handle is Max Kordek. Um, please don't bother me on Facebook, Twitter is enough. Um, <laughs> and um, else, I, I really have to say like, we are really, really open and public to the community. Um, there are always some guys from our team hanging around on Gitter or on Lisk Chat. Um, so just go to our website. You will find all the social media channels. You will find ways to contact us. So if you need something, just contact us. But please, only serious matters. Okay. No spam. That's great. All right. Yeah, let's finish it up. All right. Yes. All right. Okay, this was uh, CN. Uh, this is Yaman. And Max. And Thanks. Max, yeah, for propagating straight from the center of Seoul, um, Gangnam, Gangnam style, Seoul mm -hmm. in Korea. And uh, we're the blockchainers and we're here to uh, tell the world and the internet about everything that's going on in Korea about the blockchain ecos cryptocurrency ecosystem here. We're bringing you news, we're bringing you interviews, and bringing you all that general goodness and that Korean soul to the world. Um, if you like this content, please like, subscribe, or comment below. And if you are up for any kind of collaboration or projects, we're always, we're always, we're always open to do that. So, you know, there. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you, man. All right. Thank you, man. Thanks. Yeah. See ya, everybody. Yeah. See ya. Bye bye. See you later.